Hey everybody and welcome to another monthly edition of Rowing Chat. My name is Rebecca Caro and this month I'm joined by Tony Andrews. Tony, welcome. Thank you. Now let's kick off with you giving us a little bit of background about yourself and your personal history in rowing. Sure. I, uh... I'm an electrical engineer by training, although I've spent most of my career in software. Um, I began running when I turned 30 uh, and started getting physically active. And after a few years was having some knee problems and I had moved uh, to the Seattle area by then where you know, there's a lot of rowing activity and uh, discovered rowing as kind of an alternative activity. So I started rowing uh, as a master's rower in 1996, uh, really fell in love with the sport very quickly. Uh, started out in a sweep class, and uh, I nagged my coach about getting out in a single enough that uh, she was kind enough to take me out one weekend and get me sculling. And uh, I've done a little bit of coaching and uh, have just been active in the sport ever since. That's a great, great um, introduction. Now, of course. Part of the reason we invited you on today is you're mostly known for being the person who's written the app Crew Nerd. Now, tell us about the genesis of how that came about. Yeah, so I'd been working at Microsoft um, here for, for many years. And in 2007, well, actually, I'll back up a little bit. Um, I had, I'd started using the NK Speed Coach uh, back the old, I think it was the red model. And that was the first one that you could actually get data off of download. Um, and I uh, I wasn't happy with the software that was available from NK, so I emailed them uh, and actually got in contact with them and wrote a replacement, a better app, uh, for actually downloading and examining the data from the speed coach. So, so I developed this relationship with the folks at NK. And uh, uh, around 2007, I had gone out and joined them for an engineering meeting where we were talking about, you know, future product ideas and and uh, just kind of what uh, what was happening in, in technology at that time. And about that time, phones were were doing some interesting things. You know, GPS was just starting to to become available in various forms, and uh, the very first phone in 2007 the very first phone with an accelerometer inside that you could access through software became available. And that was made by Nokia. And so I had the idea that you could take one of these Nokia phones and with an external GPS device, at, at that time, they were all external and you had to connect through Bluetooth. I thought, well, this is all the makings of a speed coach effectively. So I thought, gee, I should be able to turn this phone into a speed coach. And so I talked to the folks at NK. They weren't particularly interested in pursuing that. Uh, and so I left Microsoft in 2007 to go see what I could do with this. And so I spent uh, a good part of the spring in 2007 uh, building a prototype. Uh, this was on that Nokia phone. Uh, got that working over the summer anyway. I went through a few generations and then uh, of testing and you know making progress and then the iphone came out and it was clear as soon as they made it possible for third-party developers to create apps on the iphone that this was really going to be the place to go it had a much bigger screen it was a really nice uh, nice phone that it was clear was going to be very popular so i dropped all of the other versions that i had been working on and said i want to be the first one to get a speed coach app running on the iPhone. So I jumped on that and in the spring, I think it was March or April of 2009, shipped the first version of my app. And at the time it was called Speed Coach Mobile because I still had that relationship with NK at the time. And I actually licensed the name Speed Coach from them to, to use the name Speed Coach Mobile. And I did that because I thought, you know, people would just instantly understood what that meant. If you're a rower and you see an app, app called Speed Coach Mobile, you know, you have a pretty clear intuition about what that's going to mean for you. And how did that go? How many downloads did you get? Uh, that went very well. Um, it, was, it was slow to start with. There were some challenges in the early days. The, 
uh, the waterproof cases that were available at the time were were really a far cry from what you can get now. And so people were naturally reluctant to take their phones in the boat with them. Uh, mounting the boat and finding uh, ways to mount it in the boat were, were more of a problem. Uh, so it took a little time to, to get people comfortable with that idea. Uh, but over time, um, you know, waterproof cases have improved tremendously. The life-proof cases now are very, very good. And there's some great mounting options, quite a variety of different mounting options from LifeProof. And in the meantime, I've also ported the app over to Android. So Android and iPhone are, are both supported now. So, so it's gone very well. At, uh, after five years, my, my agreement with NK expired. And uh, we agreed uh, that we wouldn't uh, renegotiate that going forward. So I changed the name to Crewnerd. Brilliant. And do you know how many downloads you've had to date? I, th I looked the other day, I think it's about 30,000 uh, worldwide. That's brilliant. Now, I think it's time for you to talk a little bit about who you expect to use the Crew Nerd app. Well, I, I was trying to reach as broad of an audience as possible. Obviously, I'm trying to, to sell the app and I want to make it appealing to as many people as I can. So I was thinking about, you know, typical club rowers, masters rowers, juniors programs. You know, what does the average rower want to see and what will be really easy for them to use? So I took as, as a guide, I took uh, familiar things like the the Concept2 rowing monitors um, and the NK Speed Coach, of course. And so I used uh, those products to help me kind of design my user interface. So I, I drew on those products to make the interface as familiar to people as possible and as easy to learn as I could. The other thing that I did to try to broaden uh, the appeal is uh, support other uh, kinds of water activities. So in Crewnerd, in addition to rowing, you can also tell it uh, that you're dragon boating or canoeing or kayaking, uh, stand up paddle boarding has become popular uh, since I released the app. So so those sports are also supported and and, and it does require some tuning. They have very different force profiles. So if you're a kayaker, you're paddling at sometimes very, very high stroke rates. And I worked with a fellow who used to be on the US national team in sprint kayaking and canoeing. So he actually helped me tune the app so that it would, you know, register strokes properly and, and just work well uh, for, for those different sports. Do you have um, a preset sensitivity inside the app, Tony? Yeah, I do. So based on the activity that you select, that in turn determines the sensitivity. Um, rowing, uh, there's a really a big acceleration through the stroke compared to like kayaking, where you're moving at a much more constant speed and you're just kind of tapping it along with a little bit of force on each stroke. So very high stroke rates and a much kind of lower differential between the uh, release and the, and, the, and the recovery and the drive phases of the stroke. I think it's time that you showed us some of the uh, front end user interface. Can you sure. talk us through it? Sure, so I'll show you the, so this is the main screen of the app and you can see it looks a lot like, like a speed coach monitor. Um, you'll see it's different though. You see that top row is, is larger than the bottom row. And so you can customize the app quite a bit. Uh, and rowers like that because you can, you can see a lot of different data in the app. But for most people, uh, the data can be, really be overwhelming. And so it's nice to really be able to focus on, on the, the few pieces of data that are most important to you uh, and, and really get the things that are really critical, you know, typically the stroke rate, you know, to be nice and large. Now I'll, t I'll tilt the phone back and forth just so you can see the stroke rate doing something there. So I'm just kind of, just by tilting the phone, I'm kind of simulating uh, that, uh, that force uh, differential that happens during the stroke. The other thing I can show you here is if I tap to the right, uh, this is a little bit harder to see, but you can actually scroll through here 
and uh, select all the different kinds of data uh, that's available. And we can talk in more detail later about uh, the various kinds of data that there is, but um, it's all very, very configurable. Uh, the next screen over, uh, and this looks more like the PM4, uh, PM5 monitors on a concept two. This is where you select the workout that you're doing. And if I change this, I don't know if you can see that, you can select mm -hmm. different kinds of workouts. So just like on a monitor, uh, an ERG monitor, you can say whether it's a single distance or time or uh, intervals of various kinds. And just like on the ERG monitor, you can select uh, a custom interval. And so if you want to do some crazy combination of time and distance and strokes, you know, with different rests and repeats, you can you can do all of that there. And so from the workout screen, then you would just select one of these workouts to begin it. Uh, and one of the things, this is a customer suggestion actually, uh, when you select a workout, a lot of times you don't want to start right into that first work phase. So if you're sitting there at rest and you're going to start a distance piece, maybe you wanna row into that. So you can actually select what kind of a countdown that you want into that first piece. So you can have none or 15 seconds or 30 seconds. And then just to kind of round things out here, there's a history screen where you can see recent workouts, pull up the data. Uh, you can see all of the, here's a set of intervals in this workout. And then I can go into the intervals and I can see, I can see numerically, you know, what my average stroke rate was, the distance, the time, and so on. Um, and then I can also, I can also bring up charts and graphs right here in the app. And you can, you can customize this, and I won't show you all of that, but you can customize that and, and see different, uh, different data on, on, that, uh, on that chart. Uh, there's a setting screen where there's a, a wide variety of settings that you can use to really control and customize the app. And then the last one, which is kind of interesting, is for live tracking. And so this is something that uh, kind of mimics the feature that some of the really high-end speed coach devices have. So, you know, the ones with the, the antennas and you can have uh, a whole, uh, whole set of boats on the water that are all relaying data to the coach's launch uh, in real time. And so with the speed coach, that's being sent directly wirelessly uh, between those devices. But those are really, you know, that's really the top of the line speed coach devices. And, you know, you get into more like the $600 range for, for those kinds of units. So I wanted to add that feature to the app. And it gives you essentially the same kind of functionality. You can name your boat. Uh, you give your club a name. You can put a password on that if you like. And then in the coaching launch, or actually anywhere, uh, anybody with a web browser can then go to recruiter.com, uh, configure the app there, that's the viewer app, configure it with the same club name, same password, start the viewer, and then they can see with only a second or two of delay, they can see what's happening in your boat and say, they see all the same data. Uh, the view there is configurable so the coach can decide exactly what they want to see. And there's even a map feature. So if you've got several boats on the water and I know you know, junior coaches especially run into this, where'd my crews go, right? Where is that double? I don't see them. Well, you can go right onto the map view and see exactly where they are. That's a fantastic feature set, and I'm particularly intrigued by the analysis inside the app because that means you don't have to download anything. That's right, you know, and it's great at regattas especially. So if you've just come off the water and you're curious about how that race went, you know, what did we really do on our sprint? What did the rate do? You know, were we effective? Did we really drop the pace when we did that? So it's uh, it's a great way to really see that instantaneously. Um, 
but uh, you also have the ability to export the data from the app. So I support a variety of popular data formats. Uh, I think the best one really is the TCX format. That really gives you the most, the most detail. And there are some websites where you can uh, you can export the data from CrewNerd and then upload those to websites like uh, you may have talked about these in other uh, podcasts. The roseandall.com website uh, is a great one. Uh, Rowers, the W-R-O-W-E dot R-S website. So those are two websites that uh, are all about uh, logging data and then communicating between athletes and coaches. Uh, and so it's very easy to send the data there. And then there are other apps, uh, other websites that are not so uh, customized for rowing, uh, like sportlizer.com and trainingpeaks.com. And you can send the data directly to those websites uh, directly from CrewNerd. That's fantastic. Now, I'm guessing you've just run through the high level, popular, commonly known features. I'm told you've got some slightly more in depth ones, Tony. Why don't you dive in to a couple of those that you think some of our want about? Sure. Um, yeah, and, and I'll just say most of these feature ideas are, are ones that originated with customers. So, um, We've had a lot, I've had a lot of great uh, ideas come from customers, and so I try to take the best of those and and incorporate them into the app. And one idea that uh, that came from a customer uh, was from someone who rode routinely on a river, and he said that they did kind of standard workout pieces between regular points on the river. And his idea was, you know, wouldn't it be great if the app could automatically start uh, the timer and stop the timer uh, just based on my position. So the app obviously has GPS working. It knows where you are. Is there some way that we could program in these locations, you know, wherever we're rowing into the app so that it would just know when I've crossed a start line and crossed a finish line? And I thought that sounded really interesting, especially for head racing, uh, where you know, I'd know I'd, I'd been racing the single a lot and you're in a head race and, you know, you're kind of in line waiting to start and there's a lot going on and you really would like to have an accurate time at the end of your race. But obviously when you're, you know, building up to your race pace into the start, you know, you can't just reach down and tap the screen to start the timer. So I thought that was a great idea. So what I did was add a feature so that you can draw a rectangle uh, in Google Earth. So you use the Google Earth app to go and locate on a map, uh, just geographically looking, you know, looking to see whether there's a dock or some other landmark where you know the starting line is. You draw a rectangle around that starting line, do the same thing at the finish line, and then you save that into a file. So there's a standard, uh, it's called a KML file uh, that Google Earth uses. And so if you save that in a particular way, and I've got a video on YouTube that walks through the whole process of doing this, you save that and then you put that file on your phone. And there's a way to do that in iTunes where you can take a file from your computer and actually download it into, uh, into CrewNerd. On the, on the phone. And once you've done that, then uh, when you go to that workouts page in the app, one of the options there is custom courses. And if you press custom courses, it looks at the file that you've downloaded, shows you all of the race courses that you've entered, and then you just pick one and say start. And then the app is kind of armed and ready to go. And it's just waiting to see you move into that rectangle for the starting line. And as soon as it sees you within that rectangle for two, uh, two samples, for two seconds, then it says, okay, you're there. Uh, I'm gonna start the timer. And then it does the same thing at the end. So very cool feature. Not many people use it. I think uh, you have to be a little bit of a nerd to go to the trouble of, you know, learning how to use Google Earth, drawing the rectangles, saving the file. So it's a little bit of work, but um, 
you know, if, if you're willing to take that effort and build the file, it can be uh, a, a real, real benefit. Um, I've, I've built in a few uh, of the local courses here in the Seattle area into the app kind of as, as examples for people. And I also put the head of the Charles race course in there. So a couple of really popular ones in there, but uh, anybody can go and make their own. So you say it's a two second sam two sample window, but then you said two seconds. That's quite slow for a GPS. I thought they were on a sort of ten hertz cycle. Well, it depends. Um, most uh, most phones are actually sampling GPS at one sample per second. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's one of the challenges of of doing good timing in a phone. Now, one of the features that I didn't mention is that uh, on the iPhone, I actually support uh, external GPS receivers connected through Bluetooth. Now, in the early days of of mobile phones, that was the only way to get GPS in the phone. Uh, but now you can use uh, external devices uh, to get that G ten hertz GPS rate. So Crew Nerd will actually support that. And when you use an external GPS unit, that, then you do get much more uh, responsive uh, timing uh, information. That's fantastic. Now, back in the day when the very early speed measurement for rowing boats uh, devices were on the market, there was one that had a little paddle that you hung over the side of the boat that recorded boat check. Is yeah. that something that you've managed to overcome? Um, yeah, you know, um, one of the things that uh, that I was really interested in doing is seeing how much more data I could get from just this phone in your boat. And so the accelerometer is a really great device. Um, it samples at a pretty high rate in the iPhone. You can sample the acceler accelerometer at up to 100 hertz. So it's a lot of data. And so obviously I, I was going to use that for the stroke rate, uh, but I thought there's probably a lot more that we can do with this as well. And so there, there are two additional measurements that you can get uh, in the app and they're called check and bounce. And so check, uh, you know, is coming back to, to what you were describing, uh, just trying to find a way to measure check. And I think as rowers, we kind of intuitively, you know, know what we know what check feels like, um, you know, and we can see it uh, in the boat. Um, and so the challenge was, how can I use the phone to, to measure that in, in a way that uh, would be informative to people? And so I experimented with this quite a bit. Uh, and it, it might have been frustrating to my coaches because they might have seen me out there rowing badly because I was, I was experimenting with different ways of measuring it. And to do that, I had to go out, out and row with a lot of check and row badly and see. And so over time, you know, I, I found a way to measure this that really kind of pops when you do things that, uh, that create check. And so uh, the way I did that uh, turned out to be uh, turned out to be the most effective was to look at the recovery cycle, and then look at the smoothness of your deceleration. So as soon as your blades are coming out of the water, you begin to decelerate. I'll, the purists will say that's not really true because the boat continues to accelerate forward as my body comes over and I begin the slide. And so it's somewhere during the recovery uh, that your boat actually, the hull actually begins to decelerate. And what I found was that a good way to think about check was to look at how smooth that deceleration can be, right? In a perfect world, a perfect stroke, then I, with my body in the recovery, am doing very little to disrupt the natural deceleration of the boat. And so if I rush into the catch, then that's going to cause, you know, the deceleration, you know, to have a funny, a funny shape to it, right? Or if I begin to move, if I begin to, uh, you know, press with my legs or open my back before I've locked the blade in the water, then that's also going to look like, you know, uh, a blip in my deceleration effectively. So, so that's the way I did it. And the other thing that I did intentionally was 
to not try to give you a measurement on every single stroke because I didn't want to give you a number that was going to penalize you unduly for one bad stroke or one really good stroke. You know, I think as rowers, we're looking to make durable improvements in our rowing. And so I average that number over five strokes. And so what I'm trying to do is give you a better sense uh, of trends uh, and kind of how you're doing overall right now, as opposed to, oh, that was a good stroke or that was a bad stroke. So it's check a number out of 10? So, so check is a number that goes from zero to, uh, it probably wouldn't get over 20 or 30. Uh, and so this is a common question. People ask, well, what are the units of measurement? And I, I guess I could figure out what the units of measurement are, but they would be some strange mathematical formula related to variance. And, and, and it just doesn't make sense to put units on that. But what I tell people is that the lower you can make that number, the less check you have. And, and it varies from day to day, you know, just based on wind and water conditions and what boat you're in, maybe what oars you're using even. Um, all these things uh, come into play. And so what I like to tell people is think of this as a tool that you can use while you're doing drills. So if you're, if you're working on a certain aspect of your stroke that you know is related to check, um, then this can be a great way to look and see whether you're making an improvement. So maybe you're doing a drill, alternating drills with regular rowing. You know, well, you know, look at that check number when you're rowing normally and see if you're able to bring that down. So what's the lowest number you've ever done? Oh, I think anything under 10, you know, is, is doing, doing pretty well, yeah. Do you think you could use the check number, if you're a skillful athlete, could you use it to compare different oar designs? Oh, I doubt if it's that sensitive, actually. Yeah. So tell us more about balance. Sorry, bounce. Bounce. Yeah. So bounce is another interesting one. So check, you know, the check number was all about looking at kind of what's going on horizontally uh, as, as, you're, as you're rowing. Um, the other thing that I thought would be interesting to look at is vertical motion. So as you're rowing, you know, anything that moves the boat vertically is generally wasted effort, right? Um, if the boat is dipping into uh, the water more deeply, obviously that's creating more drag. Um, if you're lifting the boat out of the water uh, excessively, maybe, um, you know, maybe you have an issue with blade depth and you're, you know, kind of coming over the over the barrel, as some coaches like to say, um, you're lifting the boat. That's you know extra energy. So, so I uh, I did a similar similar kind of thing where I look at vertical motion during the stroke. Um, I kind of allow you some baseline of a vertical motion that you're not penalized for, but anything kind of beyond uh, a basic threshold. Um, you know, I, I, I count, I accumulate that. Um, and it, uh, it is also averaged over five strokes in the same way that check is. Um, and it's just basically a measure of uh, how much kind of excess vertical motion uh, do you have in the stroke. And so that's, that's great for things like uh, blade depth. Um, it's great for thinking about posture at the release, you know, are you keeping your kind of hips forward and erect, a good, you know, a good release posture and not kind of dumping and dropping in, which would, you know, cause the bow to dip, uh, the boat to go down. Uh, similarly at the catch, you know, are you kind of lunging and dropping at the catch or are you kind of coming up quietly and cleanly and, uh, and uh, entering the water? So, Different, it's kind of interesting. The two numbers really do help you uh, make improvements uh, in different aspects of the stroke. And I've had a lot of, uh, a lot of independent rowers uh, who are working without a coach tell me that they like to use those numbers as a way to, to get some feedback since they don't have the benefit of a coach to look at them. That's fantastic. I love all of that stuff. Now, 
You're obviously a man who thinks a lot, and you obviously know rowing really well. Um, my experience of people like you is generally you've got a hundred ideas for every one that you go and implement. Are you ready to tell us about other things that you've thought about? Sure. Um, there are lots of lots of things I've I've tinkered with. Um, lots of things that we could do. Some I've explored a bit. Um, one idea that I explored a bit uh, with the folks at HereNow.com, you know, they're um, they're a, a pretty successful a company here in the U.S. for uh, for doing regatta timing, and so they've they've really kind of taken regatta timing to the next level. Uh, you know, we get uh, we get race results effectively in real time now you know and you can remember in past years you know going going back how long it would sometimes take to get results so they've made you know great strides there and uh one one area that i explored with them is uh whether we could take apps you know like crew nerd and others that are doing similar things and is there a way that we could integrate those into the regatta timing system because you know as regatta spectators um, you know, it's, it still can be very frustrating to watch a race. If you're watching the Olympics, it's great. You know, they, they spend, you know, they spend the bucks and they put these great devices on the boats and you can see stroke rate and speed and you're getting all this real time information and it's fabulous, right? And wouldn't it be just awesome if we could do that for every local regatta? And, you know, conceptually, there's nothing hard about that. You know, in the same way that my app is doing live tracking to the crewnerd.com viewer, I could be relaying that same information to a regatta system that is making that available to all of the spectators through their, through their normal website. So that's something that we've explored, but, you know, like so many ideas in rowing, uh, the challenge is making the economics work, and and also, frankly, in getting getting rowers on board with the idea. You know, this would mean, you know, getting everybody at a regatta, you know, kind of on board with, okay, you're going to take this app, you're going to take this with you on the water, um, and they wouldn't have to be crew nerd users even. You know, there could be something where. You know, you're not going to look at the data while you're on the water. You could even leave the phone in a dry bag and just stick it in there. But, you know, there'd be some setup to do and then you take it on the water and then we get, get this great information. So, uh, but like so many ideas in rowing, it comes down to the economics and things that are not conceptually hard to do, you know, still require a fair amount of coordination and development effort. And it can often be hard to find a way, you know, to really justify the investment that it takes to to pull these things together. So, and we see that with a lot of other ideas, but that's one that, you know, has been really frustrating for me that we haven't been able to bring that to fruition yet, because I think we could really change the way that people experience uh, regattas as, as spectators. Is one of the big challenges that very few rowing apps have an open API? Um, well, it's, I guess the challenge would be getting all of the popular apps to support that. Um, I think what you'd like to have is the regatta timing systems uh, yeah. be the ones who provide the API and then rowing apps like mine and others. I mean, there's no reason why that has to be a proprietary thing. Here now, .com could say, here's the API. Um, all of the popular rowing apps could go integrate with that. Uh, and uh, and then we could all, you know, as rowers, use our own favorite app, take it in the boat, but be integrated with that. And besides the spectators, just to kind of round out that idea, I think there's a lot more that we could do uh, with that along, along with that same idea to make the regattas run more smoothly. You know, when you've got uh, boats in the warm up area and the marshals are trying to get them over to the start, you know, being able to look at a map and see exactly where all the boats in this next event are currently at, you know, would make it much easier to, to get folks rounded up um, or to see if somebody's hot seating, where is that hot seat boat, things like that.
I always wanted to put an alarm in the boat, yeah. which uh, the early coxmate amplifiers did, which a lot of the high schools laughed because then the young coxswain who wasn't keeping an eye on the time, they knew when the alarm went, that was 10 minutes before race time. That's right. That's right. That's another, that would be another great thing that you could do with that. The officials could really, you could even have a countdown timer, you know, time until your event on there. So, so many things that we could do there. Yeah. I can see you're a real ideas man. Now we also talked about one of your other ideas, which is a, a boat tracker for booking boats out of your boat shed, your boat house. Is that actually live? Yeah, that is live. And so that was another one where, you know, I saw uh, an area where, you know, the, the clubs that I was familiar with were all still using, you know, very manual uh, paper-based systems. So uh, it's starting to change now, but, you know, in the past, any boathouse that you would go to, somewhere in a corner, there'd be a desk or a table where there's a, a pad of paper or a notebook, and that's where you go to reserve equipment. And it's where you go to log that I'm here, I'm taking this, this boat out, I expect to be gone for this long, here's who I'm rowing with maybe, uh, and, and just all very manual. And so folks at our club were asking, you know, can we make an online system? Because we, you know, if you wanted to reserve a boat, you actually had to physically go to the boathouse go to the notebook and write it in. And that just seemed crazy. So, uh, so I started thinking about that. Um, and, and so we built a system and uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't want to build the entire system because one of the things I was, I was thinking about was how much variation there is between clubs. Everybody has a little bit different policy. You know, can you reserve boats one week in advance, two weeks in advance? Is there a quota? Maybe you're only allowed to make so many reservations for different kinds of boats. Um, the way you get permission to row, row a boat is very different from club to club. You know, it can be based on skill level or maybe a membership level uh, that allows you different permissions. And so just, a wide array of different policies. And so that sounded like a really complicated problem. So rather than build that myself, I looked around and found a, uh, an open source system that is designed for reserving just things, reserving things in general, and then checking them in and out. And uh, so I leveraged that. It's called bookedscheduler.com. Um, they had a public API, so it was it made a great foundation. So I said, great, I don't have to build the whole thing. I can use that as my back end. And so the rowers can go to uh, our website, and it's just the bookedscheduler.com website, but it's tailored for Sammamish rowing. And we've configured it with all of our policies, entered all of our boats, all of our users. And so users can just go in and reserve a boat there. Um, and then that was a lot of the problem that solved a lot of things. Um, but in addition to that, what we wanted is a nice display at the boathouse to replace that notebook that says, here's who on the, who's on the water right now. And so we wanted to bring technology to that part of the problem as well. So what I did was write a website that integrates with the back end and gives you a nice concise view of what reservations are coming up in the next few hours, who's on the water right now, uh, and who's maybe overdue and should have been back already. And so what we have now in our boathouse is an iPad and we've got it in a waterproof, durable case. It's locked down so people can't just walk off with it. Uh, and it's locked on that web page. And so there are, there are these kiosk apps that you can get for, for iPads that allow you to lock the iPad on one web page. Uh, and that way uh, people can just see what's going on. When you get off the water, you can just tap one button on the page to say, yep, we're back, we're in. Um, and so that's kind of solves that problem. And then the last piece that I built was kind of just for fun, but it turns out to be pretty handy too. And this is to make a conversational interface to that reservation system. So the website is fine for making reservations, but I thought, wouldn't it be great if I could just 
go on my phone and send a text message and say, you know, reserve, uh, reserve the Little Thunder tomorrow at 8 a.m. for two hours. And so I built that system as well. So it, uh, it accepts, uh, I think, 10 or 12 different commands. You can say, what boats am I allowed to row? You can say, is this boat available next Thursday at 8, 8 a.m.? Things like that. You can say, uh, rowing my boat for two hours because the system knows who you are. And if you own a single or a double, it knows what your boat is. So you can be very concise, rowing my boat for two hours. Uh, and that makes a reservation for you and checks you in. So with one text message, us just walking down to your boathouse, you can send one text message and you've made your res reservation and checked into the system and it knows you're, you're going out on the water. And then when you come in, you just text done rowing and it knows who you are, uh, what boat you were on the water with, and it closes out that reservation for you. So it's basically a command bot run by SMS. Yes, that's right. Neat. Yeah, so, so that was a lot of fun to put that together. We've been using that uh, at Sammamish Rowing now for, uh, for about a year, uh, but it's all open source. So folks can host that themselves if they want, or by just changing a configuration file in my service, I can add additional clubs into, into my back end. So with uh, a very uh, kind of light amount of, of customization, you know, uh, additional clubs can, uh, can set this up for themselves. That's fantastic. So uh, Tony, tell us where and how people can get in touch with you if they'd like to pursue this. Yeah, so they can find out more about that uh, at the website boattracker.net. Uh, there's a lot of information and examples there. And you can uh, send me email at tony at performancephones.com. That's actually the company uh, that uh, is behind the little company I made for, for Crew Nerd. That's fantastic. Any final thoughts on technology and rowing? Well, I'll just throw out one other uh, idea that I've had and I've tinkered with a little bit, but I think would be really cool. And this is an idea that uses augmented reality. Uh, this could be used by coaches or I guess at regattas as well. And the idea there was kind of spurred by uh, this device uh, that came out a couple of years ago. Uh, and this was uh, one of these devices that looks like a pair of glasses, but actually kind of has a little heads up display. Uh, Google Glass was kind of, uh, the, well, it was really the most famous version of that. But there was another device called the Recon Jet. And this was made by a company up in Canada. And they made it, I think, mainly for uh, skiers, um, cyclists, and runners. I think were kind of three sports that they had in mind. Uh, and the thought was that with this uh, pair of glasses and it has a camera that faces forward, it's got GPS built in, accelerometer, but it also has this little heads up display. And so as a runner, you can be seeing your pace and your distance and so on, just without having to look down at your wrist or anything. And so I thought, well, that's a really cool device. Um, and I was thinking about taking my crew nerd track, uh, live tracking feature to the next level with that. And the idea was that instead of the coach having an iPad in the boat where they're looking down and seeing you know, what the boats are doing, they could physically just look at the boat that they're interested in. And because we know the position of the boat, we know the position of the coach, and we know from the magnetometer in the glasses which direction their head is pointed at, we can actually tell what boat or boats they're looking at. And so based on all that information, we could just bring up in the heads up display uh, the stats for that particular boat. Now you could do the same thing at uh, regattas as well. And I thought th this would be great at, uh, at head races. So you're sitting, you know, sitting along the, the course of a head race, boats are approaching, they're going by, and wouldn't it be cool if you could just look at a boat and see, see the information for them. So 
the technology isn't quite there for that yet. We aren't all wearing Google Glass just yet, uh, but that's something that I, I thought would be a really, a really kind of gee whiz idea that maybe is a couple of years still in the future. Well, I'm going to add one because this definitely is a couple of years in the future. I've always found it very hard to teach the body sequencing uh, to someone who's new to the sport. So if we could have some form of um, probably virtual reality rather than augmented reality, uh, mm -hmm. whereby your body movements were automatically tracked by a machine, so pushed through the postures yes. so that you could learn the body sequencing and then you could layer on top of that the power and the athleticism, which is already monitored in all of the ergos and different rowing machines. And I vividly remember years ago sitting down with a coach called Fred Smallbone, who took me and Claire, who was my pairs partner, and he had us sit in the gym, each of us holding an oar, and he supported the other end of the oar, um, which we both had our hands on the handle, and he supported the other end just with a strap, and he had one of us control the tap down and the movement of the hands away and the body swing, um, although obviously we didn't roll up a slide because we were sitting stationary, but for us to figure out how the differences were coming about between our movements around the finish. Hmm. That's very cool. Um, yeah, there's you know there's a lot of technology that we could bring to bear uh, on on a solution like that. The um, the Xbox, so the Microsoft Xbox uh, had an accessory that they no longer sell, but um, was was in use for some time called the Kinect, K I N E C T, the Microsoft Kinect camera, and this camera used infrared uh, vision. Uh, so it, it had a system where it sent out a pattern of infrared dots into the scene and you couldn't see it because it was infrared light, but it sent out this pattern of dots. And then they had a pair of cameras that were looking and so they were set a few inches apart and they were looking in the infrared uh, spectrum at those dots that were sent out. And the purpose of this was to be able to detect uh, players. So this was for, I'm um, standing in front of my Xbox, I'm playing some game where I move my hands or I move my body. And they had skeleton tracking software developed that would look at these images and then generate uh, kind of a skeletal view of your body frame. So this is where your head is, your arms, your joints. Uh, and so the technology was there to do that. So you can imagine taking a camera like that, looking at you from the side and really being able to see what your legs are doing, your, your hip flexing, your arms, all of, so you could really see all of these things um, and then uh, coordinate that with all of the other telemetry that you're getting uh, from the ERG uh, that you're on. Um, and then being able to give you really, really, uh, really deep, meaningful feedback based on that. So yeah, the technology is there. And, and once again, it's a matter of the economics. I'm sure I'm not the first rower to talk about using a Kinect camera to do something like that. Um, the challenge will be, can you find enough rowers willing to pay enough for an app like that uh, to make it economically viable to to go do the development for it but you know these are the these are the kinds of great ideas that I think are just you know crying out for for somebody to to go build them Tony it's been absolutely delightful your insights from technology into rowing and back again is a breath of fresh air um, I'm certainly personally looking forward to going and trying some of the existing ones. And thank you very much again for giving us your time on Rowing Chat. Thank you. It was, uh, it was really fun talking to you.